So, Kirsten, if we look back at the past three months um, of your stock performance since we last spoke, mm -hmm. it's been quite explosive. Um, what are the key things that has driven um, this sort of performance in your stock? Sure, that's a good place to start. I do believe that we picked up a number of very um, aggressive new shareholders over summer. And I think a lot of that was really driven on fundamentals. I think that they see that we have a patent protected process and a very um, new industry that's ripe for disruption. Well, let's talk about the patented process. I understand that you're doing things with graphene and, and graphene products that other companies can't. Mm -hmm. What is that? Walk us through that. So we are the only company who can legally explode hydrocarbon gases for the production of graphene. That's very different from the rest of the industry, which is either using graphite as a feedstock or methane via microwave plasma. For hydrograph, so under our patent umbrella, we can use all hydrocarbons with an oxidizer, and we also have the ignition method patented as well. And so we have a very, very high purity feedstock. And we also reach a temperature that no one's able to achieve, which gives us a completely unique graphene. And I think it's likely the only genuine graphene available at industry scale. Now for use cases, why does such pure graphene matter? So with graphene, and to take a step back, the, the real definition of graphene, and I would encourage any investor that wants to take a deep dive in, into the industry to really look at the data sheets of companies. A lot of companies are not listing all the traits of graphene and the actual definition of graphene, it must be 100% sp2 bonded, must be 100% crystalline and 100% or close to 100% carbon. And so for a hydrograph, we have 100% crystalline. So the lattice is really intact. And for example, it's not amorphous like carbon black might be. And sp2 bonding is really what defines a nanomaterial because that's what creates the sheets. A lot of these companies, they're either not listing it or they're listing something that's not third party verified. Well, how do you scale production of repeatable quality graphene to customers as you scale your production level? So for us, because we have a huge degree of control, we have upscaled that reactor size now numerous times. Our first reactor was about a four liter chamber and now we're at 70 liter chambers. So we could likely look at larger reactor sizes, but more realistically, we will just produce additional reactors. And I think um, back to your last question, so defining graphene, the use cases of graphene, why pure graphene really matters is because you want to have it that you have a very small particle size that is interacting with everything atomically precisely, if that can make sense. And also you want to make sure that there's nothing that's really going to disrupt the lattice. So when you're looking at the graphene lattice, you want to make sure that for one, the lattice is intact, there's no holes, which can easily happen with other production methods. You also don't want any impurities on it. And anything that is disrupting the perfection of that kind of chicken wire honeycomb lattice is going to re result in reduced performance. And we will have a kind of um, explainer on this, on our production method versus others and why it performs better out shortly. Talk to us about your customers because it, you've disclosed that you've got about 60 projects in the works with your graphene. Who are these guys? And um, uh, most importantly, what kind of revenue you know, generation is this going to be translated into for, for HG? So now it is actually over 70. We can't uh, name names because we are under NDA with most of our customers. I would say the average customer at scale is looking for tens or hundreds of tons um, on an annual basis. And many of these customers are looking for more than a thousand. And it goes without saying that's a multi-year ramp up really to get to that level. Overwhelmingly, and I would say even in the past year, we've seen a really big shift it is overwhelmingly for us defense-based. And this could be working directly with primes, or it could be working with, for example, a chemical company that might downstream sell to a defense contractor. I mean, when you say defense right away, I think of another related topic, which is to onshore um, domestic, or bring on the production of metals um, to, to, to North America versus relying on imports. Um, how does HG fit into that equation? Right. So this is a, a very hot topic right now. And most graphite is, of course, coming from China. 
we are not reliant on any graphite to produce graphene. And so when we're looking at graphene, it's not a critical mineral per se, but it can absolutely reduce our reliance on critical minerals. So we're seeing a huge amount of federal funding, at least in the US, for the onshoring of these critical minerals. And for us, we have all US patents. We've always been US focused for our operations. And with our uh, redomiciling the company from Canada to the US, it's really a brilliant story, and we are quite confident there, that there will be federal funding available. And when is it possible to talk about timeline, or is it important to talk about that? Yes. So on timelines, there, there are multiple layers here. So for one, um, we have been given a strong indication of interest that there, you know, our work at the Geek in the UK. The U.S. Army is likely going to be building a, a U.S. geek or a domestic geek, and it will be to some degree uh, focused on hydrograph. We will be one of uh, many companies that are there. But at least from a graphene perspective, we do believe we're, we're going to be playing a very large role. That is projected to open in 2026. I think that um, the degree of the facility remains to be seen. It might start small, focus more on energy storage, and would be much, much larger in about two years. And with federal funding, starting now, we would be looking at funding from 2027 on. So it is always a bit of a longer path when you're looking at federal funding. Investors always want to know about what kind of catalysts um, are coming up so they can watch out for them. Before you go, talk to us about what folks can potentially be looking forward to um, in the next three to six months for, for Hydrogas. A huge degree. So for one, we are targeting a NASDAQ uplist um, ideally by the end of Q1, because the government was shut down, the SEC was not available for comments on our file. So that may have uh, given us a slight delay to the beginning of April, but regardless, we're very close. We'll be redomiciling the company to the US, of course, to really unlock that federal funding and better relationships with US primes. And apart from that, we're gonna be opening our Austin headquarters in the middle of February, and then our large scale production facility by the end of 2026. A couple more follows before you go, sure. just because there's so much to unpack with, with this story. But where are your investors today, most of the investors for Hydrograph? This is a good question. And this is part of the reason why we are shifting the company to be more U.S.-based. We have, at last calculation, um, over 60 percent, I believe, that are U.S.-based. So I think with this and, again, with the huge amount of capital that's really available in the States, um, especially with uh, global politics, it just makes sense to be to be more focused there. And this story is a bit of a complicated story, right? I mean, in terms of getting people educated, becoming more familiar with what you do, mm -hmm. it's like a constant or I assume a constant process. It's not just here's what we do and and that's it. There's a lot more education that has to happen with um, a story like this one. How do you kind of break the barriers down with current investors and potential new investors as well when it comes to communicating the story? I love it when investors really want to go deep and when you can have more of a technical conversation. It is unfortunately a very technically dense story. So it, there's always that educational aspect. But I think, you know, to kind of summarize, I think any investor, anyone that's interested in the story can understand we make, we take something that is very low cost and readily available. So our feedstock gases are available all over the world. We convert them in one step using almost no energy into something that's extremely high value that has an unlimited market potential. We're operating at 80% margin. We are, I believe, the best in our space and everything is patented. So that alone, I feel, has created a very, very strong moat. And when we look at all of the interests that we've had, you know, if you're looking at graphing, making everything lighter, faster, stronger, to kind of summarize, it's a pretty attractive story. And I think that really, this is only the beginning. I think in terms of hydrographs, um, I guess, rise, I think this is still very, very early on. Very useful that you highlighted your moat so clearly there for us, Kristen. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So guys, if you want to learn more about Hydrograph, I know, again, there's a lot to unpack there, uh, but you can go to our, our site and search uh, HG on the search bar to see what other people may be saying about the company. Um, that should help you learn a little bit more about HG, especially if you're new to the story. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.